So now we're going to go into some of the stuff that this um, spinal cord does. We kind of talked about the functions of the spinal cord. Now we're going to get the details of those functions, of how those things work. Um, so let's see, what does it say? In order to maintain homeostasis, the spinal cord must propagate nerve impulses, propagate nerve impulses, and integrate information. What does that mean? Well, this is kind of cool. So let's look at this. Remember your white sand dollar? Your white matter tracts. What is a tract? We talked about this. Remember I said that the spinal cord has the job of ushering everybody into the right elevator, whether it's going up or down, and that elevator is a tract. Okay? So your white matter tracts will take nerve impulses um, to and from the brain. So those are your elevators, okay? These are my elevators. Elevators. My white matter tracks, did I spell that right? Yeah, are my elevators. It's going up or down. So that's what's going on in that white sand dollar. Now, there was an evil gray butterfly in the center of the white sand dollar, right? What does the evil gray butterfly do? What is its job? It is going to receive and integrate incoming outgoing information to perform those spinal reflexes. That means that in that evil gray butterfly, I'm going to have sensations coming in from a sensory neuron, and then I'm going to have a reflex that is immediately going out through a motor neuron, okay? Remember, this is that instance where I um, had to stop Erica from hurting Trinity, put her in time out, because you're my... <laughs> Sorry, because you can take it. No. Gray matter has the unmyelinated, white matter has the myelinated. Right? And then that's okay, because it is super confusing. It's a lot of information, which is why I need to pace myself. But I need those questions so I can keep going back to it. So, <laughs> white matter was myelinated, gray matter was unmyelinated. Up until now, that's what we had learned. And then today we reiterated that white matter had myelinated axons and some neuroglia. Gray matter had unmyelinated axons, right? Cell bodies and some neuroglia. Okay. Now I'm telling you that in that white matter, there are tracts that will take information to the brain or bring back down instructions from the brain, meaning I have sensory neurons going up with sensations to the brain, and I have motor neurons coming down with instructions from the brain. So those are my up and down elevators. That happens in that white matter. What happens in the gray matter stays in the gray matter. <laughs> what does that mean? It means that in the gray matter, I have sensory neurons coming in with a sensation or um, an impulse that needs to be taken care of immediately. We can't wait to send it up in the white matter or the elevator. We have to stop this now. And that's a reflex. And it's a spinal reflex because it actually happens. It loops around in the spine, in the spinal cord. Goes into the spinal cord, comes right back out from the spinal cord. It didn't go to the, the brain to be processed yet. Right? It's before any of that happens. Does that make sense? The white matter, the white matter which has your myelinated axons, is the one that's going to have tracts, which I call elevators, that are taking your impulses to the brain or bringing them from the brain.
it's coming in, right? Well, some things won't have to go into the gray matter. Some things will go straight into the white matter and go straight up to the brain. Yeah. Do what? Yeah. <laughs> some things is like boring paperwork and stuff that just goes right to the principal. We don't, it, that can sit on his desk for a while, not a big deal. It's just the, the emergency, life-threatening, um, you know, painful, stimuli that need to be taken care of immediately that reflex that take place at the spinal cord in the gray matter okay so if you remember the gray matter or that evil gray butterfly is your reflexes your spinal reflexes the white matter are the tracks that go up and down okay let's look at this so maybe this will solidify solidify it for our visual learners okay this is what's going on in the white matter all of these big uh, red and blue sections are tracts the blue ones are sensory tracts the red ones are motor tracts meaning all of these blue things are sending up sensory neuron impulses to the brain all of the red ones are taking from the brain impulses and sending it down through your motor neurons to go to your different organs and muscles and things okay so essentially that all of this white matter is sort of like a highway back and forth of things going up and things coming down and i don't even i don't need you to memorize any of these tracks or anything i want you to understand the concept of what's going on here that we have these tracks some are sensory going up to the brain some are motor coming down from the brain Okay, and that's in the white matter. Now we're going to talk about what happens in the gray matter. And we're going to spend the rest of today and next, some of next week on this too. Okay, so what happens in the gray matter? What are the things, what are those reflexes that we can bring in a sensation and immediately give a response without going to the brain, without talking to the principal? We're going to take care of it right here and now. Okay. That is what we call a reflex. So a reflex is a fast, automatic, involuntary. You have no control over reflexes. They're just going to happen whether you like it or not in response to a stimulus. Okay? Yes? Okay. Now, spinal reflexes are those reflexes that take place in the spinal cord, in that gray evil butterfly. Um... So it says here, the gray matter of the spinal cord is my integrating center for spinal reflexes. And obviously, reflexes help maintain homeostasis. Why? Because any impulse or any sensation is going to be a deviation from homeostasis. Your reflex is meant to return things to normal. Okay? Now, that whole thing where you had your uh, spinal cord... And there's your evil gray butterfly. And you had, remember, your uh, sens sensory neuron coming in. And then it relayed. It relayed onto a motor neuron and came out. We call this a reflex arc. And I even went to the point of writing it down for you. This is what a reflex arc is. You have a sensory receptor that picks up a sensation. Maybe it's heat. Let's go to the campfire again, because I love putting my hand in that campfire. So I put my hand in the campfire, my sensory receptors in, um, in my fingertips. Those pain receptors are firing off. They're going to go through a sensory neuron. They're going to connect with an interneuron that will take it right to a motor neuron that will go to those muscles of my hand and finger and cause me to retract it from the fire. Okay? So that is an example of a reflex arc. This was somewhere, an instance where I had a stimulus. I sent it to the spinal cord through a sensory neuron. I sent back immediate instructions through a motor neuron and caused that painful stimulus to be taken away. Okay? That's a reflex arc. And, of course, we're going to look at them in detail. Because <laughs> you all know I love detail. Okay. So this is it. Here we go, look. This looks like a, a little chunk of skin right here. There's a nail, maybe it's not a nail, maybe that's just a tack. 
<laughs> something, something metal and sharp was pushed into this piece of skin, okay? That is going to initiate your pain receptors to fire. So your receptor here picks up, those are pain receptors. It sends this impulse of pain in. Remember, this is your sensory neuron with that cell body in the dorsal root ganglia. It is going to come here into that evil gray butterfly. It's a long distance, so we do have those connecting neurons. Those are your interneurons. This one here, it happens to be purple. That interneuron will connect it immediately to a motor neuron in red. That motor neuron is going to go to the muscles that control this body part up here and help it get out of that painful stimulus. Okay, that's, well, it's more like that happened, this happened. This could be whatever effector organ is gonna help create that. So even if it's your fingers picking that thing out, that's what's gonna happen, okay? <laughs> We're going to see good, this is just in general, in general, okay? <laughs> I know, I said that and I was like, that, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> in general, a receptor picks up on a sensation, it relays onto a motor neuron, motor neuron causes something to happen, something to change. You want to all fix it somehow. Whatever that, that happens to involve, we're going to fix it, okay? And we're gonna look at this same reflex arc, but in different instances, different types of reflexes, okay? So really this, this type of slide is just for you to understand what a reflex arc is. So now we're gonna go into detail. Don't even look at me like that. Okay. <laughs> These are vocabulary terms that you need to understand, okay? I'm gonna let you guys look these up. But in general, I'm gonna tell you a few that we have to know. When something is ipsilateral, it means it happens on the same side. When it's contralateral, it goes to the opposite side. Oh, look at them writing really fast. No, I want you to look these up yourself. Okay. <laughs> Monosynaptic, what do you think that means? It means it, it happens with just one synapse. Polysynaptic, it takes several neurons for this to happen. We've got several synapses that have to happen at once for this to work, okay? Uh, reciprocal innervation, you don't have to worry about that too much. We may see an example, we may not. I should have taken that out. I don't know why I left it, okay? <laughs> reciprocal innervation means you may have um, two different things that are innervated at the same time because they have to work together for something to happen. We're gonna see an example of that where, you know, um, if you have an agonist muscle and an antagonist, they both have to be reciprocating because for one of them to work, the other one has to relax, okay? So whenever you have things that work in conjunction or work opposite each other, you innervate them together so that they can um, allow the other one to do its job when it needs to, okay? But you don't have to worry about this one too much. But in really, it's not, I'm not gonna ask you these definitions, I'm not. I just want you to know them so that when we're talking about reflexes, you know what it means when I say this is an epsilateral reflex or this is a monosynaptic reflex, okay? Are we still good on time? Yeah. Okay, we may just take this one here. Okay, so this is the first one we're going to do. Now, when it comes to reflexes and slides like this, yes, you do need to know this. You need to understand what a stretch reflex is even if it's just a definition. Okay, so what is a stretch reflex? A stretch reflex means that whenever you stretch a muscle, it is going to cause contraction. Okay. Well, that's confusing. What does that mean, contracting a stretch muscle? Well, let's look at it. Here we have the quadriceps muscle, okay? Notice that the tendon inserts here in the tibia, and it also does have that patella, that little bone inside of that tendon, okay? This is a reflex that all of you have done on yourself at least once, and I encourage you to get up, sit on your desk right now and try it out. What does it mean? It means that whenever you stretch the tendon here for this muscle, if you 
hit this tendon, it's gonna stretch that muscle, those muscle fibers. So the receptors that are in this muscle will sense that stretching or that elongation of that muscle and cause it to reflexively contract, okay? Have you all ever gone to the doctor? Maybe it's been a while since you've been to like a pediatrician and that's usually the ones that do it where you sit on the um, table and they hit you with a little hammer right here and then your leg shoots up because your quadriceps contracted. That's what that is. That is your stretch reflex, okay? Does this make sense? Okay, when you're looking at this picture, I want you to kind of ignore this right now because it's just going to confuse you, okay? We'll come back to it. We will come back to it after we've secured this idea in our heads. We'll come back and look at what happens, okay? Because that is an example of that reciprocating innervation. But I don't want to throw too much at you at one time, okay? So... My stretch reflex is when a muscle is stretched or that tendon is stretched, that muscle will contract reflexively, whether you like it or not. Okay. An example of that is that knee jerk or patellar reflex where you hit um, that tendon and your, your leg jerks out. Okay. It is ipsilateral, meaning if I stimulate, if I stretch this muscle or this tendon, that same side is the one that's going to contract. That's what ipsilateral means, okay? So if the hammer hits my right knee, my right leg, right. It has nothing to do with the other side. And it is monosynaptic, meaning it's pretty simple. You have a little uh, receptor here and it's going to uh, sense the stretching of that muscle, it's going to send that sensation. It's going to relay onto your motor neuron. Your motor neuron goes back and says, hey, muscle contract. We're being stretched out of our limits. All right? All right. Um, I don't know if we want to go on to the next one. I think we might want to stop there. Well, we'll do one more. Just one more. Because this will make, this will allow us to go back might as well just finish it. Okay. So this is the one that I told you to ignore from the other slide. Okay. This is the one that happens on the opposite side, not opposite body side, but it means if my, if I'm hitting this tendon here and my knee jerks out, my quads are contracting. Well, what about my antagonist muscles on the other side? Right? What about my hamstrings? What happens to them? So this is going to cause relaxation of those muscles. How does it do that? Talk about it, look. And I, wrote, I actually wrote it down here not to make it confusing, but it relaxes the agonist muscle when the antagonist is contracted. Again, in this picture, imagine that this is that same tendon or knee jerk. It's a jerk, it's that, um, Stretch reflex, okay? So if I'm sitting on this bench and the doctor hits my, my right knee, right? My quadriceps will contract in response to that stretching. But my quadriceps cannot contract unless my hamstrings are relaxed. And this goes back to that, sorry. This goes back to A and P1 where we said every muscle has an agon, uh, is it, uh, every muscle will have an antagonist right? Like every muscle has one that works opposite. In order to contract that muscle, you have to relax the opposite or it won't work. You'll have two contractions at the same time. Nothing's going to move. Two forces working against each other, okay? So whenever you have that stretch reflex in a muscle, the opposite muscle has to have this reflex, which is the relaxing one, okay? All right. So um, that is going to be polysynaptic. Why? Because this all originated, this all started over here with the stretch reflex, okay? Or it started with a muscle that needs to be used. So it started somewhere else. 
And this was just a result of that other action. So it is polysynaptic and it is epsilateral. It's on the same side as the muscle that's contracting, whether it's contracting by reflex or it's contracting because you're trying to use it. Okay, this is how we can move and do things without consciously thinking about what our muscles are doing. You may consciously flex a muscle, but you're subconsciously, reflexively relaxing the opposite muscle, whether you know it or not. Does that make sense? Cool. So now we can go back and look at this right here. So this is where now I can unerase this stuff and actually look at it and see what it's telling me. So this is basically the same thing right? Only it's happening in response to this reflex. So it means that when I do this little test, knock on that knee, and this muscle needs to contract at the same time, I will also have, look, this is the same sensory neuron that is also relaying here on an interneuron, going to a motor neuron, which is going to relax your antagonist, okay? It relaxes the opposite. Now you see how they fit together? Okay, and coincidentally, yes, we did take care of this in the classroom, but we do have to report it to the, to the uh, principal, no matter what, so there is always one that goes to the brain. But the idea is with reflexes, it's taken care of at the spinal cord, even though that information is sent up, we don't wait for instructions. We do what we have to do now and then send the report later. Or it is actually at the same time, but. It takes time to get up there. And if you're me, it takes even longer to get up there. So we talked about the stretch reflex. That was the one where um, stretching of a muscle or its tendon causes that muscle to reflexively contract. Remember that? Yes. OK. And then we talked about the one that goes hand in hand with it, the tendon reflex. Cool. Let's talk about what happens when you step on that uh, nail, OK? The first reaction, if my right foot, if I'm walking and my right foot steps on a nail or a piece of glass, a painful stimulus in my right leg, instinctively, reflexively, the reflex will be to withdraw the leg from the pain, right? So you pull, pull your leg up. Yes. Notice that when I did that, <laughs> I almost didn't do it. But when you pull that leg up, I'm now completely standing on my left leg. So as I'm flexing, in that leg that had the painful stimulus, I have to extend in the leg that is going to support my weight. So the first reflex that we're going to look at is that withdrawal reflex. That's the flexor reflex that causes me to flex my leg away from the pain. And then that other one is on the next slide. They go hand in hand, okay? So, and these pictures are kind of confusing because if you look, here's that painful stimulus and it makes you think that they stepped with their left foot and the right foot is moving. No, this is the same foot in this picture. They're just trying to tell you that when you stepped on this, all of that happened to cause that leg to move back. Okay, so don't let the picture confuse you because it confuses me when I look at it. I'm like, what? The first time I saw these pictures, I was like, why? Why is it drawn that way? Why would you step? Why would you have a stimulus on one side and then the reflex would be on the other side? It didn't make any sense, but it's actually the same leg. Okay, so what's happening here? You step on a nail, the painful stimulus goes through that sensory neuron. Notice I'm, I'm following it up here. It goes in from that posterior root. It relays right here in the middle onto an interneuron that eventually takes it to a motor neuron, goes out through that anterior root, goes to the muscle, causes those um, flexors to contract flex the knee and remove your foot off of the painful stimulus, okay? That is what's going on right there. That is that withdrawal reflex. There are other things that are going on at the same time because as this impulse is coming in here, okay, it may involve other levels of the spinal cord. So you have this sensory neuron that can also, um, at the same time, relay onto a neuron that takes it up a level on the spinal cord or relay on it to an interneuron that takes it down a level on the spinal cord. Make sense? That is why this is going to be a polysynaptic response. I'm going to clear the slide so we can look at it all one more time. 
So there's that sensation happening here, going up to the spinal cord. Now look what happens. You'll notice that there's a synapse here with an interneuron and another one right there with the one that goes right to that motor neuron. So we're able to give the same instructions on different levels of that spinal cord, depending on how many muscles need to react with this reflex, okay? All right, so that is the withdrawal reflex. Um, and I wrote it out for you, plain and simple. Step on a nail, muscle contracts to remove the leg. Can't make it easier. Okay, polysynaptic and it is epilateral, meaning the stimulus, I step with my right leg, my right leg will be the one that has the reflex that it contracts and removes it from the painful stimulus. Okay, now let's look at what happens to the other leg at the same time with this reflex. Okay, and that is this one right here. That's the crossed extensor reflex. So if I am flexing my right leg, my right knee, I have to extend the left in order to support my weight. Okay, so again, this is the same exact scenario right here. You have the nail that went in, um, went into the relayed on a motor neuron, it went up a level, down a level, whatever it had to do. This picture on the left is my flexor reflex or withdrawal reflex. Okay. Over here, that's the other leg. That's the other leg. And that is where I am going to see this crossed extensor reflex. Okay, so what happens? I want to highlight it because I don't want to cover it up, but I want you to see it. I'm going to highlight it in yellow. Okay, good. It, the magic is happening right here. Okay, what happens? That same sensory neuron over here that brought that signal into the spinal cord, okay, not only does it relay onto interneurons that take it to motor neurons at that level, above that level, below that level, it's also going to relay onto an interneuron that crosses over to the other side of the spinal cord. And that's what's going on here, okay? That's what's happening right here. So those interneurons are carrying this signal over to the other side, and that is where they are going to relay onto a motor neuron, giving that signal of extend the leg because we need to support ourselves in the opposite leg. And all of this happens at the same time, okay? Uh, any questions on that? No? Okay, so this is going to be a contralateral uh, reflex because the stimulus was on the right side, but the leg that was that had to extend through this reflex was on the opposite side. Okay, so you have a stimulus on one side, but you have a reaction on the opposite side. So it's a contralateral reflex. It is also polysynaptic. I've got several levels that can be involved, several neurons that will have to um, have this impulse go through them. So that should finish up our reflexes, and now we can go into our next PowerPoint.